Welcome to the Manhattan Institute's conversation with Tulsa Mayor G.T. Bynum. I'm Michael Hendricks, Senior Fellow and Director of State and Local Policy here at MI. Mayor Bynum is the 40th mayor of Oklahoma's second largest city. Uh, now in a second term in office, Mayor Bynum's emphasis on safety, opportunity and competition has shown how local leaders can bring people together and compete globally. So in this interview, uh, I hope that we can learn how mayors can appeal to the metropolitan majorities across the country with common sense solutions to local problems. Now to welcome Mayor Bynum to the interview, I'll note that uh, the mayor was born and raised in Tulsa to a family where community service runs deep with both a, a grandfather and a great great grandfather serving as Tulsa mayor before him. Uh, mayor G.T. Bynum for his part has gained national and international prominence for his leadership. And before serving as mayor, uh, was on the city council, was a managing partner at a firm helping Oklahoma companies to grow, and served in senior policy roles for some legendary senators, specifically Oklahoma senators, including former senator and MI scholar, the late great Tom Coburn. Mayor Biner, Bynum, let's, uh, let's have you on screen. Uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Thank you very much for having me on. I, I couldn't help but uh, envy your bookshelf back there. And glad to see uh, you and I. I finally found somebody else who has that Calvin Coolidge biography. Not a lot of uh, Coolidge enthusiasts out there, but glad to find Well, We can book. agree we need more of them. Uh, Absolutely. You also know there's, a, there's a book on Oklahoma behind here, but we're going to talk about that. I more. saw that too. Your, That's right. And your art in the background is pretty good. There's got to be some stories with that. But I know our time is short. Um, Mayor Bynum, you know, uh, the country, our cities have been through a lot over the past year. Tulsa has been through a lot. Um, but to start us off on a hopeful note, what have you been proudest of over the past year or so in Tulsa as mayor when you look back? Well, you know, I, I'm somebody, I love the history of our city. And uh, I think a lot of the time when you think about uh, being here in, in the oil patch, in Tornado Alley, uh, a city built next to a river that historically flooded. We always talked about Tulsans as a resilient people and talked about it more in a historic sense as a kind of one of the explanations for the way that um, really philanthropic contributions and a community focus have grown in our city because you, the D, it's driven into the DNA of our city that people have to help each other out in hard times for us to get through those challenges. Well, in the last year, I mean, we've dealt with the, the greatest public health crisis in the history of our city with a global pandemic, uh, a national recession, a major impact economically to our two largest economic sectors in energy and aerospace. Uh, we were uh, hit with a flood. We were hit with tornadoes while we were flooding. Uh, we were hit with a cyber attack uh, and, and sundry other things. And yet through all of that, this generation of Tulsans really focused on what we could do to help one another out, putting one foot in front of the other each day, getting through it. And now, you know, we're emerging from all those crises as a city that is growing rapidly uh, in seeing historic economic investments in our city. And so it's cool to see your city living up to a historic standard and knowing that this generation of Tulsans can hang with any of the previous ones that came before us. You know, I was going to ask you, what are some of the greatest struggles? But it sounds like what you're proudest of is just the other side of the coin from the struggles and seeing how Tulsans have thrived and come together during that moment. That's that's part of, I guess, what you're what you're proud of, even amidst all this pain and loss. That's exactly right. I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, finding the good and the bad. And, and the reality is we've had a lot of hard times in, in the last two years not just here in our city, but in every city around the country. Uh, but I, I really believe that what's come out of that is that we have proven to ourselves uh, that we are a strong, resilient community uh, and that we have high expectations for ourselves and for our future and, and for building a better city for the next generation. And we're doing all of that in historically challenging times. And I didn't even mention all of the political dynamics uh, that go into this, you know, when people say, oh, this is just like the Spanish flu, like the mayor of Tulsa during the Spanish flu didn't have to deal with Facebook epidemiologists spreading misinformation every day and terrifying people. Uh, you know, the, the, the 
end of specialization and the challenges around public communication and the polit- and doing all of this in a presidential election year when partisan divisions are inflamed, all of that just created more and more challenges, and yet we've endured and we're thriving. We'll get more into COVID-19, uh, and, and as we know, of course, everything you read on the internet is true, but one thing that I've really read on the internet that I know is true, Tulsa's been making headlines for its remote work, and in, you know, what have you seen uh, w- about the future of cities, the future of Tulsa, um, through this lens of remote work and more people being able and willing to choose a city where they feel they have the most opportunity, not necessarily where they're stuck? Well, you know, I was just meeting uh, right before this began with a team from Harvard Business School who are doing a case study on uh, our re- remote work program here in Tulsa. And, and I will say one of the areas where I feel like we are very fortunate is that we have a very innovative philanthropic community here in our city. This is not a group that just writes checks to get their names on buildings. They're really trying to find ways to be leaders nationally. And uh, certainly one of the areas where we've excelled, thanks to the George Kaiser Family Foundation, is the creation of what's called Tulsa Remote. And the idea behind that, you know, initially was that they would pay $10,000 for people to move to Tulsa and work remotely from here based on the belief that we have spent decades investing in ourselves and building a tremendous quality of life with low cost of living. And so it's a perfect environment for remote workers. Uh, What we don't have and and we're not going to have because we don't believe in it is the you know, idea of massive deal closing funds where we're going to pay companies to come to our city. We'd rather just have a great quality of life that lures employees who can work here remotely. And the key of that program, though, because there was such a broad response, it wasn't that we're going to get a bunch of mercenaries to come to our city and be paid $10,000 to live here and they stay in their apartment, work on their computer all day and then leave after a year. I mean, the acceptance rate into that program was more competitive than any Ivy League college in our country. And for the people that ultimately made it through, they had to prove that they were committed to playing a role in our city uh, and trying to make Tulsa the kind of place where they would want to live for the long term. And all of this started before the pandemic hit. And so um, I'd like to say that there was some great strategy behind it, but uh, fortunately, we, we just happened to be in the right place at the right time, just as uh, everyone around the country started to shift into a greater emphasis on remote work and companies started to focus on it in a more comprehensive way. Well, that really does bring up a couple of things that, you know, I, I'm sure we've all been reading about these issues. One is that other remote work schemes that other cities have been passing they don't really seem to be as successful as Tulsa's. You know, the the pickup rate is slower. They don't get as many applications. People don't tend to stick around. But in Tulsa, it's different. And we've also seen, you know, with the Amazon HQ2 beauty contest, we've seen, you know, incentive deals just getting higher and higher and higher. Your emphasis on quality of life as being a great economic development tool, I find that really fascinating. And I wonder, just tease out, like, what 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 goes into quality of life as an economic development tool that keeps, retains, and attracts people from around the country? Well, I I think that for us, we view our competitive advantage is that we can offer very high quality of life for the kind of quality of life that you would have to go to a much larger city to enjoy. But by going to that larger city, you're getting a much higher cost of living. So you have low cost of living and high quality of life here. And, And just to give you, I mean, a couple of examples of things that have just unrolled here in the last few decades. I mean, we built uh, the BOK Center. It's the four, two of the last four years, it's been the number one concert arena in America. Uh, one year we lost out to Staples Center. The other year we lost out to Madison Square Garden. Not bad competition to be in. Um, we just opened in the last three years the greatest public park gift in American history, uh, the Gathering Place, which has uh, been rated by USA Today as the number one new attraction in the United States. Time ranked it as one of the 50 places in the whole world that people have to see. Um, it, it has won just about every award that a major park can win. It was designed by Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates who did Brooklyn Bridge, 
Park in New York and Maggie Daly Park in Chicago. And, and calling it a park doesn't really do it justice. I mean, we, we, have, we are building right now uh, a, a new facility for the Gilcrease Museum, which is the greatest collection of American art and history uh, that the federal government doesn't own. Everything from Benjamin Franklin's copy of the Declaration of Independence to Bob Dylan's archive are in this museum. So these are just, you know, I've told you about three or four things, but we have two dozen different initiatives underway right now in Tulsa to to establish great quality of life that's accessible to everyone who lives here. And we're only an hour and a half from Oklahoma City if you're driving the speed limit, uh, where you have access to uh, the Oklahoma City Thunder and all the exciting things that are happening there in our sister city uh, on the other end of the turnpike in OKC. And so we just think that we have a lot to offer here and we have chosen to focus our public dollars into those kinds of investments rather than into deal closing funds where we pay a company and, and hope that they'll stay here. The other thing that I think sets our remote work program apart is when people come here for that program,